Second reading for today is from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 through 24. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Last week we spent some time talking about Elijah and I had originally been thinking I would be preaching on Psalm 30, but I just couldn't leave the story, the story of Elijah in this widow's home near Zarephath. Remember, Elijah was there, and he had been sent to this exact place to speak to this exact woman because God had gone before him in order that he would do a good work amongst her and her family. He did that through, through bringing a miracle, by providing food in the midst of drought, in the midst of famine. And we talked about how this was a big deal because through the word of God, this widow and her entire household, we would, we would definitely assume, came to faith in Jesus Christ and the promises of God through God's word. That this was a big deal because this happened on the very doorstep of Baal. Baal was the foreign god, the false god, the false idol of the, Sid- the Sidonians, and Zarephath is this little village on the shore of the sea. Baal was the storm and sea god, and so you can see how this context all comes together. We also talked about how in Exodus, God had showed that he had authority over Baal, Uh, already, that this was something that God had already demonstrated in that he had his people camp directly before the cultic site of Baal Zephon before they crossed the Red Sea. During their exile in Egypt, Israel had turned to idolatry and worshipped the gods of Egypt. Among them definitely was Baal Zephon, who was this god of the Sidonians. The Egyptians had incorporated worship of Baal, of the Canaanites, into their pantheon of false gods, at least as far back as the 1500s BC, of course. This was especially prevalent in the eastern Nile region of Egypt, a land known as Goshen, which is famously settled by the Hebrew people when Joseph brought his family over during the famine then. The Egyptian pharaoh back then Amenhotep II was particularly involved in this worship of this false god. And this becomes even more interesting as we think about the context of the Exodus that God sends his people right there and crosses the Red Sea, showing how utterly powerless Baal is. Fast forward a few years to the 800s BC. So from 1446 in the Exodus, and here we are now in 800 BC. And Israel has a new king and a new queen, Ahab and Jezebel the Sidonian. They lead the people of God in worship of this false god, this false idol, who who we would say was clearly a demon in the worship of Baal. God sends Elijah to Zarephath in the midst of drought and famine, and there Elijah ministers to and is ministered by this widow and her family. In short, everything worked together for the good of Elijah. He had food, he had company, and he had believers with him. And now after some time had passed, this woman's son become gravely ill and has died. Having a son in the ancient Near East in this time and in this place was a really big deal. The son was the one who inherited everything, the oldest son. 
It didn't matter whether you were a Jew or a Gentile. This woman would have been a Gentile, but this is a big deal that her son is ill and dies. Remember the story of Naomi and Ruth? Naomi was a Jewish woman who went into the neighboring lands and there uh, her sons got married to women and then her husband died and her sons died and she was left with nothing. And what did she do? She tried to send her daughters-in-law away. One of them left and the other one, Ruth, stayed with her. It's remarkable because this, this woman, Naomi, was left with nothing. She was destitute. To not have a, a husband or a son in this culture was being as good as dead within a few years. You would be taken advantage of and you would be thrown to the side of the road because you had nothing. The story is remarkable though, the story of Ruth and Naomi, because Jesus Christ is descendant through Ruth. She ended up marrying Boaz and Boaz is, is in the line of David. The ancient world was a horrible place for a woman without a husband and son. We can be thankful that that isn't the case anymore. And that's largely because of of really the Christian values that we have. So this woman, seeing her lifeless son, likely clutching him in her arms and weeping, cries out in agony as you would expect. Why has her son died? This is a good question for us to think upon. Jesus ran into similar questions throughout his ministry. Think of John 9 when he comes to a blind man. His disciples asked Jesus, why had this man been blind was, since birth? Was it because of his sin or because of the sin of his parents? Jesus answered and he said, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. The widow continues to cry out and she says to Elijah, What have you against me? Notice the woman doesn't blame God for the death of her son. She doesn't cry out to God, why have you done this to me, O God? She cries out to the prophet who's there, Elijah, this man who had come and stayed with her. What have you against me, O man of God? It's as if she thinks that by Elijah's presence and his his faith and his piety and his righteousness that he has as a prophet makes her look like a really tarnished penny. Like she is all the more sinful. Like her sinfulness is especially highlighted. And Elijah, this Israelite prophet, is the prophet of Yahweh. And so how could, how could you not draw this comparison, we might think? She is a Sidonian. She is a, 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 a Gentile. She's not one of the chosen people of Israel, she's of no particular importance to the outer world. The prophets in the northern kingdom were known for their word of law. You think about this, think of the history here. Remember in the southern kingdom you have the line of David and there were good kings who led God's people in the worship of Yahweh and and taught them the law and pointed to the promises of God and then in the northern kingdom where you had the other 10 tribes, that these these northern tribes, not a single good king. In fact, Omri, uh, this would be Ahab's dad, it says that he was the worst king that there ever was and then when Ahab comes, it says he was even worse than Omri. And so these, these kings didn't lead their people in worship. In fact, they led them away. And so the prophets that God sent came with a, law, with a message of law that was appropriate for people who had turned from God. It doesn't mean that the gospel wasn't there. Those promises that point to God's faithfulness and to his mercy and to the promises that he has, but it does mean that the law was definitely preeminent in that ministry. And so... The people who turned from God and wanted to be like the other nations and have kings like the gods of the, of the kings of the other nations, that's exactly what they got. They got kings who led them away from God. So it makes sense that the widow would think that Elijah has come, especially to proclaim the law to her, and that the death of her son is the result of this. It's her punishment for her sins. Imagine, though, if you will, what it must have been like for Elijah to hear this, because that was not why Elijah was there. God's prophets and Christians today are indeed called to proclaim the law to the unrepentant. 
But that is not why Elijah had come to this widow. Elijah came to this widow in order that God would be glorified and so that this woman would believe in Yahweh's promises. And so if you put yourself in in, in Elijah's shoes, he had to have been heartbroken to hear these words, to to see this, this, this young boy, this young man, we don't know how old he was, to see him dead and his, his mom weeping over him. Because it's not just the son, it's, it's her life. She has died with her son. And what a horrible thing to behold. Elijah, though, then he does something that is unthinkable for a Jewish person. He goes over to the corpse of this boy. This, this is to be made ritually unclean. This is a prophet of God. He would be removed from any type of public worship. Well, and maybe, maybe that's not such a big deal to come to think of it because of where he's at. He's in, in the land of the Sidonians, right? He's not going to the temple anytime soon, it doesn't seem. But he goes and he, he, he is moved by this woman's plight and by her faith that she had demonstrated through, through providing bread for him when she thought that she had nothing more to give. And so he grabs this boy out of her arms and the word that's there is that it's like an intensive. It just says he took. But it's almost like he had to pry this boy's body from his mother. And he takes him upstairs to the prophet's chamber, sometimes we call it. The, the, uh, in, in the New Testament, it gets translated sometimes as the inn. And so this is when you think of like, when there's no room at the inn in the birth story of Jesus, what it actually probably means is that there was no guest rooms available in this, in this little town of Bethlehem. So anyway, he takes this boy and he takes him to the guest room, to the prophet's chamber, to his own place where he has been staying, lays him out on the bed. And there lying the boy down on the cot, he stretches his body over the boy three times and he cries out to Yahweh. He cries out to God. Take note of this. The woman cried out and now Elijah cries out. The woman mourned and now Elijah is mourning. Before with the oil and the flour, the woman, the boy, and Elijah had rejoiced together because they had food when they thought they would have none. And now they weep together. This is what compassion looks like for us as Christians, is to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who are rejoicing. And we are to do both of those things. This is what, what it means to, to love your neighbor who's mourning. Remember Job? In this, the book of Job, it's a long book, but it's a great story with great, great wisdom in it. And, and Job, remember, his family dies in catastrophe after catastrophe. All of his, his money, his wealth, his land, everything is taken away through, through raiding and through disasters. Things look really bad for Job. But then come his three friends, and they come and they sit with him, and what do they do? They don't say anything. They just sit there and they weep with him. This is, this is what we're, we're told to do over and over in Scripture, is to weep with those who weep, to have compassion and empathy for those who are suffering. And, and so Job and his, his friends, he, they, they end up going on and messing up because they begin opening their mouth. But, but then hear, hear what Jesus says about this in the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is, this is how we, we comfort people, is by being with them. There's a ministry of presence that we cannot deny. And Elijah here, he is exhibiting this for us. He's demonstrating it for us by taking the woman's plea and making it his own and interceding on her behalf by praying to God. Elijah, then he prays, and in the words of his prayer he says, O Lord, my God, or O Yahweh, my God, Elijah's name, which by, by the way means Yahweh is my God. So it's almost like he's saying his own name here, which is pretty amazing to think about. He says, Yah, uh, O Yahweh, my God, let this child's life 
come into him again. Literally, it's let this child's soul come into him again. Death is the separation of body and soul. The body remains here, but the soul is in the presence of the Lord in heaven. To to be absent from the body is to be present in the presence of the Lord. Elijah here is praying for the soul of the boy to return and to bring life to the body for the sake of this widow who has already faced so much with the death of her husband and through this famine and now with the death of her son. Without her son, though, she will be destitute. The widow's cry becomes Elijah's. The widow's prayer becomes Elijah's. And God, we know this about God when we pray to him. We know that he always hears our prayers. That's a huge promise. He always hears our prayers and he answers our prayers. He doesn't always answer them according to what we desire, but always according to his own will. But in this case, the father's will was that the boy would live. It's an amazing thing. It was God's will that this boy would die, that the works of God would be displayed in him. God went before Elijah and and commanded this woman for bread, but now has gone before Elijah in order that this good work would be done to her, for her, for her son. So that way her faith would increase and his faith would as well. And so we see that, that this boy's soul does return to his body. He's revivified, he's brought to life. And, and then rejoicing takes over again. And so they rejoice together. This widow sees that God is not only the God who provides bread and water in the times of need, but he is God even over life and death. Death itself has no power over our Lord, over our God. Elijah is about to confront the evil King Ahab. If you look down on the page a little ways, he's seen, he's seen, having seen God's magis, or mastery over death, Elijah having seen God's mastery over death, his faith now is able to walk him into the very fires of hell to confront Ahab and Ahab's God. Remember, Ahab's God is Baal. He's going to confront them face to face. The resurrection of this boy fits into the larger story of God versus Baal too. In Baal mythology, every seven years, Baal goes to battle against one of the other Sidonian uh, gods named Mot. Mot is the god of death. And so Baal, every seven years, has to submit himself to this battle. Sometimes he wins and sometimes he loses. And if he wins, then the people believed that they had seven years of plenty. And if he loses, then they believed they had seven years of famine and of drought. Baal had to submit to death and at times was overcome by it. But this is not so with Yahweh. This is not so with our God who orders the drought and orders the rain himself, he brings life from death. Next to Yahweh, all of the false gods of Egypt, all of the false gods of Sidon, all of the false gods of the Pacific Northwest in America are nothing. They're nothing. Sometimes in the Old Testament, it describes idols as no gods because that's what they are. They're nothing compared to God. God overcomes them all. This is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is Yahweh. This is the God of salvation who saves his people from slavery, whether it be in in Egypt or it be in Babylon or it be from sin, death, and the devil. God used his prophet to proclaim his victory over Baal and over death. The resurrection of this widow's son is just a taste of that which is to come. God promised to send a greater prophet, greater than Moses, greater than Elijah, and that this prophet, he says, would die. He would die on the cross. But his death would not be caused by his sin or the sin of his parents like every other death that happens in this world because that is why there is death. It's because of sin. Not necessarily because of your specific sin, but because of the sin that has entered this world and has ruined it. And has made it so that way it is not as God had initially desired it to be. It was ruined because of sinful men and women. And because of the sin that corrupts our very nature. And twists us. And turns us to enjoy sin more than God's very presence. But this this prophet, this 
man, this God who is even more than prophet, this son of God, Jesus Christ, he came and he died on the cross, not because he was sinful, but because he was bearing your sin and the sins of all the world upon his shoulders. Jesus died in your place. He took your punishment for your sins to the cross and he defeated death. Every time he defeats death, in fact, Jesus lives and you who believe in him will share in his resurrection. Death is this awful reminder that we live in this sin-ruined world. It was never God's intention that any would die, but when sin entered in through Adam, so did death. Death is what we deserve because of our sins and the world minimizes this. They minimize sin and they minimize death. They act as if it's nothing. They sometimes don't even acknowledge it all. They, when they think of their sin, they, they say things like, it's not hurting anybody, or this is probably a more popular one today. If there's consent, it doesn't hurt anyone outside of this relationship. What they fail to realize is that sin always does hurt. It always destroys, it always damages. And this damage is not just temporary, it is eternal because it separates us from God. It puts us into a relationship, not of one of reconciliation like that we have through Jesus Christ, but it puts us in a relationship with God of wrath, rightly deserving his wrath because of his holiness. For believers, we tend to think that we need to root out all of our unrepentant sins. So we strain and we think of all the sins we've ever committed. We even go back years and years sometimes to try to dredge them up, to try to uncover them so we can confess them because we feel like this is what we must do. I remember in, uh, when I was in high school going to a Bible study at, at, at the place, we, we just called it the house. It was across from one of the churches in town. And we had youth groups there and Bible study. And we were having a study one time and the youth leader was telling the story about how we need to bring God into our house and bring Jesus into our house and open up the doors to uncover our sin, that we go to the living room and show him everything that's there, into the kitchen, we go to the bathrooms, we go everywhere. And then when we come to this closet, we don't even know what's behind the closet because that's sometimes how closets are, right? But that we have to then try to pry open and destroy this door to let Jesus into the closet. And, and the scriptures tell us no. That's not what we need to do. What we need to do is confess the things that are conflicting in our conscience. Those things that we know we have done that are sinful and everything is covered by the grace of God. We don't need to plumb the depths of our heart to root out every little thing we've ever done. Instead, what we need to do is trust Jesus Christ. This is similar to Martin Luther's experience when he was, uh, before the Reformation, when he was a monk in a monastery, he would go into confession, he'd pour over every detail, and he'd be in confession for hours and hours and hours. And then having exhausted himself and his confessor, he would then leave the, leave the room, and he would get only a few steps, and he'd turn back and go back in, because, oh, I forgot something, or, or I probably did. That's not what God is calling us to. He's not calling us to have an anxious conscience that dwells upon our sin, but instead to dwell upon his promise that he has forgiven us and that we now stand in this relationship, not of one of a transaction where now I have a sin here, now God gives me a little forgiveness, and now I have another one, God gives me a little more. Oh, this one's a little bigger. He needs a little more love. That's not what this is. God pours out his love and his forgiveness richly and abundantly upon us. And we stand now in this relationship, not of wrath, but of reconciliation. We are now his children and he delights over us. He sings over us. Brothers and sisters, rest in the grace of God who has called us from sin and into his marvelous light. Finally, death and resurrection, this death and resurrection of the widow's son points us to the final chapter of God's plan for salvation for you and for me and for the whole world. That chapter tells us that not only do those who believe in him go to heaven, but on that last day, they will be raised from the dead. Remember, death is a separation of body and soul, but as we confess in our creeds and, and as we read scripture, we see this to be true, that there is a bodily resurrection on the last day. Christ will return. The dead will rise and we will have new bodies that are perfect where there's no suffering and there's no pain. 
And our soul, just like the soul of this boy, will be reunited. And we will stand before God and he will judge us. He will judge those who have done evil according to the evil they have done. And he will judge those who have believed in Christ according to the good that Christ has done. According to his righteousness. And for those who believe, we will then dwell in the new earth and in the new Jerusalem. And we will be serving God gleefully and happily forever and ever. And so we have no need to fear death because through Jesus' victory, we too are victorious. The bottom line is this, Christ Jesus died and rose again. And because of him, you have spiritual life that will never end. And your body will be resurrected, perfect, glorious, and everlasting, at peace with God and in his presence forever and ever. Now may this peace of God, which surpasses understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.